Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently on, the Wajuk Noongar people, and the land where this conference is held, the Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay respects to their elders, past and present. I'd like to acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. My name is Rama Agung Igusti, and I am a doctoral candidate at Victoria University located in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne, Australia. I was born in Australia and come from both migrant and settler backgrounds with European and Southeast Asian heritage. I'm speaking today about discourses of risk as a mechanism for the structural exclusion of racialized groups and individuals that have been made other. The racialized other is constructed as a risky subject at once both at risk and a risk to others. How we understand risk, how we understand what is risky and how we understand who gets to take risks is constituted by the social, political and historical contexts of the present moment. Risk is culture bound. Risk is ideological. Risk is also a discursive tool it is a discursive tool that engenders the creation of particular neoliberal practices and processes that masks insidious forms of racism central to the structural exclusion of racialized communities. And as this presentation argues, also continues to perpetrate ongoing misrecognition. Through these practices and processes, the racialized other is controlled and managed and risk provides the logic for why control and management is required. How we understand risk is framed by questions of morality. The risky subject must be made responsible, but must never be trusted, must not be given agency. The risky subject must be made immoral. It must be feared and must be feared for. This presentation will present how we have come to understand risk in this present moment. In the midst of neoliberal and racial projects or neoliberal racial projects for each constitutes and sustains the other. It will ask who is made risky and who gets to take risks. It will show how risk as a neoliberal discursive frame is deployed at the borders of partnerships between community-based organizations and racialized communities to enact and sustain structural exclusion and racialized inequities. Other writing has shown the link between discourses derived from neoliberal ideology or abstract liberalism and how they serve to sustain the workings of white supremacy. For example, the fantasies of colorblind meritocracy. Risk is but another effective and pervasive discourse reproduced in organizations and institutions, which serves to obscure the relations of power within which whiteness is ensconced, whilst contorting the racialized other into subjects to be controlled and managed. Neoliberalism can be understood as the favoring of free market competition and private property rights, reduction or abolishment of government intervention and expenditure, and evaluation of individual freedom of choice. And although often represented in everyday discourse as an efficient and self-evident way of social organization, neoliberalism is associated with a disproportionate accrual of wealth and opportunity among certain groups. These inequalities continue to follow the well-worn fault lines and grooves of racialized divisions. Exploitation is not merely a byproduct of neoliberal modes in contemporary times, but a continuation of race dynamics that were necessary for the emergence and maintenance of coloniality and modernity. In short, race and neoliberalism are interdependent and co-constitutive. And the emergence of neoliberalism as a dominant political philosophy in the West has led to social control and regulation through new and distinct forms of governmentality. Neoliberalism not only provides the technologies for asserting power and control, but it also simultaneously masks race and racialized social relations. Sociocultural theories of risk attend to the social and cultural contexts within which understandings of risk emerge they emphasize the socially constructed and mediated nature of risk. The work of Ulrich Beck and Anthony Giddens on risk society has been one influential approach. But the writing of Douglas and Waldavsky and Foucault is perhaps more useful for what we are examining here. Douglas and Waldavsky's cultural symbolic approach proposes that our values structure what we see as risky and our responses to these risks. 
we construct an other in order to maintain collective identities. The other and otherness is then perceived as a risk or risky and must be protected against. Within this, the other is seen as amoral. This functions as a maintenance of group cohesion. Approaches which extend on Foucault's writing on governmentality see risk as a regulatory power within neoliberal society. Present forms of governmentality are constituted by neoliberal principles such as a focus on individualism and the minimization of the role of the state in regulating private business or provisioning services and welfare to the population. One form of regulatory power within neoliberal societies is risk. Authorities and expert knowledges define risk and what is risky and how risk should be regulated, both directly through coercion and indirectly through self-governance as neoliberal subjects. These forms of regulation are provisioned through networks of discourses, administrative and legal structure, and material settings and conditions to exercise power and construct particular subjects. Thus, risk avoidance becomes an individual moral imperative that is imbricated in self-policing and marginalised groups and individuals are constructed as both risky and at risk, to be surveilled, managed, disciplined and wholly blamed for their designation of risk. However, Olofsson and colleagues have proposed that previous approaches to risk fall short when attending to how we consider the relationship between social constructions of risk and the reproduction of new and complex inequalities that are mapped onto a variety of social categories such as race, gender and class. So whilst these frameworks offer important understandings, we can better map the embroilment of risk, neoliberalism and race. Race not as a variable, but as a central feature of contemporary neoliberalism, which necessitates risk as a regulatory mechanism that maintains and sustains the present world order. So who is made risky and who gets to take risks? Technologies of risk analysis are employed within criminal justice and mental health spheres, with much writing documenting how decisions are guided by the application of higher risk to racialized groups. A process whereby institutional racism becomes hidden amongst seemingly scientific objectivity within the science of probability. Within public health, there have been studies which have examined how racialized groups are constructed as at risk, shaping clinical decision making. Clinicians identified these groups as needing more vigilance and having to take more responsibility for themselves. Neighborhoods that are home to racialized communities are often also constructed as risky and are seen to be in need of gentrification or whitening. Risk discourses decontextualize relationships with racialized communities from histories and politics. Risk is cast as objective and value neutral and removed from the social and cultural. And racialized forms of structural exclusion are explained away as simply forms of risk mitigation. Yet the values that underpin white supremacy, the values that construct the racialized other, are the same values that construct that other as a risk to be mitigated, managed and controlled. Risk becomes synonymous with marginalization, minoritization and deficit. To be at risk or risky is recoded in an implicit language of race and class and conflated with marginalized identities. In the Australian context, we can also map the ways risk is discursively deployed in the service of neoliberal and racist projects. Stanford and Taylor examined how whiteness operates through risk rationalities to maintain neoliberalism and the racialized status quo. Rational rationalities are the processes through which institutional thinking, values and actions represented in rules, laws or regulations are reasoned and implemented within an institution. They locate whiteness in each of these rationalities, how risk is conceptualized as a future probability to dislocate privilege from historical antecedents and how whiteness determines racialized others through risk thinking. How within the substantive domain, risk utilizes discourses that construct heroic and demonize risk-based subjectivities. So for example, Aussie battlers or welfare dependents that are moralized and implicitly racialized and how whiteness renders the formal rationalities of risk, the rules, laws, and regulations as racially and politically neutral. Through this process, risk is deployed as an objective technology of governance by the dominant group in the service of maintaining white privilege. 
These same rationalities can be seen in government approaches to self-determined and Aboriginal-led organisations. In a recent submission by Chelsea Bond and colleagues to the Productivity Commission, it was posed that Indigenous-led organisations are situated within a system that structurally creates the conditions to be undermined, constructed as deficient and to be blamed for poor progress. In other words, too risky to be trusted to manage and govern themselves. Brigg and Kerf Bibb argued this form of technically oriented governance leads to controlled communities rather than community control, as organisations are constrained by prescriptive funding arrangements and reporting requirements. Not only do seemingly neutral practices work through seemingly neutral systems to maintain control, Indigenous forms of governance and ways of working grounded in Indigenous culture and identity are de devalued and cast as problematic. I can also draw on an example from a project I've been engaged in documenting the work of a collective of creatives from the African diaspora here in Melbourne, Australia. This collective had been funded to develop a self-determined initiative to challenge racialized symbolic and structural inequities for the development of safe and nurturing spaces that provide opportunities and mentoring for young artists from the African diaspora to enter the creative industries, as well as facilitate critical conversations, intergenerational dialogues and build solidarities with other communities that experience racialization and its psychosocial, cultural and political effects. Part of this initiative was the securing and activation of a physical space as a community resource to hold events, exhibitions, workshops, and foster healing and relationality. This involved negotiating a memorandum of understanding and lease with a social housing organization who managed a property where this space could be located. This space was located in a building alongside social housing and a bar which had just secured a tenancy on the ground floor. The process of securing the lease and coming to an agreement was fraught with tensions as the negotiations were stalled, conditions were changed and interpersonal issues arose. These tensions were often framed in terms of risk management, but would be experienced through a number of culturally unsafe interactions with the community housing organisations representatives, eventually leading to a refusal to sign an MOU and eventual withdrawal of the space on offer. Here, an employee of a large community organisation that had partnered with the collective and had been involved with the negotiations for the space recounts these events. The bureaucratic constraints. The implications of being African. The mitigation of risks. and how things may have played out otherwise. Here, risk technologies in the form of risk management and legal teams and formal risk rationalities in the form of policies, frameworks and tangible mechanisms that restrain and control are deployed. Risk is applied unevenly as it is perhaps only those that have been raced and made risky that are subject to these barriers or as eventuated excluded. The rationale for exclusion then lies in discourses of risk, which erase the centrality of race and culturally unsafe experiences that provide a broader context to these interactions and relationships. Here, one of the collective members recounts their experience of these events. The incongruence of how risk seems to be applied unevenly between the bar and the collective as tenants. The risk posed by black people, by people of colour. How it feels to be made risky, a predetermined problem. How it feels to be a question mark. Whilst risk rationalities work discursively to separate the operation of power from race, race cannot help but rise up through individuals, infusing and filling spaces of encounter. To read these encounters in this way is a literacy held by those raced and risky subjects, to feel race stick to you, hidden in the coattails of objective rationalities. Risk discourse becomes not only an obscuring logic, but a form of gaslighting that negates the experience of violence and exclusion as determined by a system of race and racism. 
Furthermore, it becomes a powerful denial of racism, a misrecognition deeply grounded in colorblind ideologies. Here, the employee of the community organization partnered with the collective reflects on his role as part of these negotiations. His feelings of not acting strongly enough. Grounded in a protection of whiteness that misrecognizes experiences of racism. That questions the very presence of racism. and becomes shrouded in neoliberal organizational discourses. So to conclude, the management of risk enables the management of racialized individuals, communities, and organizations. It does this whilst protecting whiteness and perpetrating forms of symbolic violence. Structural exclusion is racialized and rationalized, made objective and race and risky subjects who feel the stickiness of race are gaslit and misrecognized. We can see these dynamics at different levels and in different spheres in government policy, within institutional systems and processes, and in the interface of community organizations and racialized and marginalized communities. Neoliberal democracies make claims towards a post-racial and post-colonial future of prosperity and equality for all yet ignore the racial and colonial foundations from which they are built upon. This engenders a collective willful ignorance that permeates organizational and institutional instincts for the management and control of racialized subjects. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to me speak. And I'd like to finish with urging everyone to support some of these campaigns towards justice for First Nations people and communities here in Australia. Thank you.